Yep. Do I look at that camera? <laughs> so today uh, we have Neil Dunn uh, from Polymateria. Thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. Amazing. Um, would you be able to kind of go over the overarching vision of what Polymateria do? Yeah, so we are set up to um, tackle fugitive plastic. Um, and that has been an issue that has really captured the imagination of everyone all around the world because it's such a vis visible environmental issue. Yeah. Uh, we were um, set up five years ago to, to develop a technology that would effectively biodegrade the most littered forms of plastic in the world, yeah. but most crucially without impacting recycling. Mm. So that is a, a really interesting feature to the technology, which is an ability to time control exactly when the technology kicks in. And that allows us to allow for supply chain, allow for the in-use phase, mm. but then at a particular point in time, which we agree with the brand, the plastic then loses its utility. And just like anything else that's perishable, starts the process of return to nature. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of um, you, the key differentiators uh, in your technology, would you be able to kind of give us an overarching view of that? Yeah, so when we were set up by our founders five years ago, yeah. there was really two camps claiming biodegradation. One was saying we can biodegrade plastic, but effectively all they were really doing was this. They were taking plastic okay. and making microplastic. Um, and the reason they were doing that is they weren't attacking the hard crystallinity of the polymer structure. Mm. So that is the cornerstone of everything we do is knowing how to do that for the particular plastics that are most highly littered. Mm -hmm. There was another camp that were claiming biodegradation, but actually when you scratch below the surface there, what you found was it would biodegrade maybe, but only in industrial composting facilities. Okay. And even, even in the UK, only 4% of people have access to industrial composting. So yeah. one was not credible and the other was not scalable. So yeah. the brief to our scientific team was come mm. up with something that is credible mm. and can scale and work with the existing value chain. Mm -hmm. And is that your technology there? Or That's what it does in the first couple of weeks. So really? this is a couple of examples of, um, well, this kind of shows what, what would happen a plastic naturally in nature, mm. uh, where you have something like a polyethylene film that can be yeah. used for bread bags, salad bags, all that kind of stuff. Mm. When it winds up in nature, it will physically fracture and break, but it's still a polymer, it's still a plastic. Mm. You know that because when you put it, melt it, put it back together, you can create something of form and substance. We could create this, we could create this, we've created a little lid here. So this can still be recycled? It, it's, it, can, still, it can still be recycled, but it's, it's incredibly bad for nature because it will persist over time. Okay. And when you use this, what's called live dead visualization, you mm. can see these big red blotches emerging mm. because nature's foot soldiers, microbes, fungi, and bacteria are attaching themselves to the microplastic, trying to feed on it, colonize it, mm. don't get any substance out of it. So they ultimately die. Red is dead. On the other hand, over here, green is alive. So this is an example of our technology in action. Wow. Where in the first instance, it looks exactly like your, your film. It performs exactly the same. When you weather and age this, what you see is because of the actual chemical transformation that happens, there's yeah. now nothing holding this together at a molecular level. Yeah. So we've broken the bonds between the atoms yeah. in the really hard crystalline region. Okay. And when you feel that, just see what, yeah. see what you think. Yeah, it, it, it's disintegrating. It's... It, yeah. it cannot persist because yeah. it's lost its structural integrity. Yeah. When you try to put it back together, then what you get, as opposed to something like this, is a grease-like wax material. Mm. Okay. It's also biologically compatible or um, biologically available. Yeah. Which brings us that back to this picture here. Nature now see it as a food source and something that they can attack and colonize. And when you mm. see these green blotches emerging, mm. it's because they are, they are able to take what is carbon mm. and fully assimilate it into carbon dioxide, water, and biomass. Okay. That's interesting. I mean, you, so it can literally turn into like a wax yep. type of substance. How long did it take, you know, for you guys to build out the technology to be able to create something like this? Yeah. So um, we did a lot of listening and a lot of talking to uh, scientists and yeah. academics and, and industry around yeah. what, why had previous mm. efforts really largely been, been ineffective. Mm. And, and, and what they drove out over a four to five year period was, was effectively four things. The mm. first was an inability, inability to attack the crystallinity in the polymer structure. Knowing how to do that is, is centrally, central to everything that we are, we are doing from an IP perspective. Mm. So that's the cornerstone of, of, of everything the business is about. The second thing is using chemistry to mimic what we would kind of typically think of as a, as a prebiotic. 
So this is a way of kind of tricking nature mm. into it attacking and colonizing the material. Okay. So that's what makes it recognizable to them. That's what makes them want to engage with us. Mm. And those two things together are what allow us to get that biodegradability effect. But you don't want to do that in a way that's completely unadministered mm. because you will encourage littering and you also can have it triggering in supply chain. You could have it being triggered in your home when it's just kind of sitting in the closet. Yeah. So what we do is we then have a, a masking effect. And if I can pull yeah. over this picture here, you can see this process where the first phase, mm. it's completely stable. Okay. Uh, in somewhere like Kenya or maybe in India, this can be as quick as six months mm. because the lack of infrastructure means that once it's supply chain and in-use phase is finished, the likelihood of it going back into recycling is very low. Mm. Um, so once the date is up, it then starts to go off a cliff and lose its structural integrity and start yeah. the process of return to nature. In the developed world, we can set that to be two years or three years mm. because there is more recycling infrastructure yeah. and you want to give it every chance to happen. Yeah. So that allows us to kind of basically time control exactly when the technology is triggered. Mm. And we can be as precise as the exact month thanks to everything that's in this laboratory in here, yeah. which is tools and techniques that we're using from the automotive industry. So when they give you a guarantee on your uh, car bumper, yeah. they have tested it in weathering systems very like what we have, yeah. but they're looking for performance over decades. Yeah. We're looking for that same degradation over, over weeks and months. That's interesting. I mean, um, we tried to reach out to you previously and you mentioned um, that you're in India. Um, I mean, how are you seeing the global plastic landscape right now? I think there's a huge knee-jerk reaction and yeah. there's a rush towards a lot of unintended consequences. So the okay. initial reaction is firstly to ban plastic. Um, and there's no doubting that there are some ridiculous uses of plastic that just mm. need to be stopped. It's, yeah. it's um, um, definitely a quick win to turn off the taps. Mm -hmm. um, however, for food contact approved packaging, mm. There is really no alternative, particularly when you start thinking about full life cycle analysis and carbon and water and yeah. food versus land and some of those other factors mm. that are even maybe more important than plastic pollution itself. Mm. So plastic has huge utility, um, particularly when it comes to food waste and food preservation. If yeah. food waste were a country, it would be our third largest emitter after the US and China. Wow. So plastic plays a role in preserving food and keeping mm. it around for longer. The issue with plastic is end of life. It's what mm. happens when it winds up in a, in a, outside of a recycling facility yeah. and in the natural environment, which is what we're solving for. Mm. That's really interesting. I mean, plastic has caught the hearts and minds of everyone. I mean, I've had friends that really didn't pay attention to the environment all of a sudden are you know really conscious about their plastic usage I, mean, I find that I found that quite bizarre um, I mean amongst all of the things that actually cause um, uh, uh, pollution you know factory farming methane in the environment I mean, how comes why do you think plastic has really captured the minds and hearts of everyone well it's an interesting discussion, you know, what, what triggers contagion and, and how do we kind of reach these tipping points all mm. of a sudden on some of these big nexus issues. And yeah. people will point back to Blue Planet and what David Attenborough did just in terms of simply showing the, mm. the, the, the whale or the, the calf of the whale that, mm. that, was, that was dead because it was full of plastic. And that, that moment is said to have broke the internet in China with the amount of times that that particular um, show from October 2017 was, was viewed. Um, but even before that, Greenpeace were showing examples of, of dead seabirds for 10 years yeah. washing up on beaches. And when they, when they rot, you see they are, they are ultimately full of plastic because yeah. they, are, they are starving. So yeah. I, I'm not an expert in kind of social yeah. you know, contagion, yeah. but we do seem to have, as in we humans seem to have identified with the visible nature of this mm. and whilst carbon is a colorless odorless tasteless gas and climate change is incredibly dangerous and at the moment sydney is literally burning and california is burning we struggle with um relating that to the to the predic predicament that we're in from a climate change perspective mm. however the immediacy of plastic and its impact on animals that we you know we kind of um, see around us and have grown up to love mm. um, has become in a lot of ways symbiotic with humanity's um, uh, kind of lack of, 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 of kind of empathy for, for the environment. Mm. So I think we're attaching a lot of emotional relevance to it, mm. um, maybe un unable to, to kind of 
process how big some of those issues, some of those other issues are. Mm. I mean, have you seen like an, uh, have you seen the economic model around uh, the sustainable sector kind of shift now? Because obviously the environment has captured the hearts and minds of a lot of people now. Um, it's now fashionable for companies to really be seen as um, sustainable now. I mean, uh, how has like the most recent surge in um, the interest of our environment kind of helped your type of business or has it? Um, so big businesses aren't really set up for disruption and agility and, and, and moving at pace. And in a mm. way, it's almost unfair to expect them to, to operate that way. Mm. They, they have multiple functions internally that in their own right operate like individual businesses and to really embrace new technology and create um, the systems level response that's needed you've got mm. to engage marketing you've got to engage people who run the the p l mm. the commercial part of the business you've got to engage r d and each one of them has their own sequential process that they need to go through yeah. and that can become a very elongated almost glacial uh, approach to trying to incubate and and accelerate um, new technologies so if you look at where real disruption has come from over the last 10 years it, it's really unicorns it's your ubers it's your Theranos's, it's your uh, uh, WeWorks. Yeah. W what's interesting though is is the lack of purpose and the lack of values in each of those organizations <laughs> so if any yeah. of them had of had um, um, a kind of a, a clean or green uh, innovation and, and, and mandate, and some of them would argue they had, with a culture and with values and an ability to bring the world with you, mm. um, arguably they, they could have really kind of led the way and become these kind of green unicorns mm. that kind of show us how much disruption is possible over a 10-year year period. So I think it's probably going to be a combination of these green unicorns emerging, but partnering with the more agile, more task force-based big businesses to help mm. accelerate this technology our technologies like this but but big businesses need to kind of um, recognize their own limitations and try to eradicate a lot of the internal silos in mm. order to effectively bring you know proper disruption to the market mm. I mean over the next say three years I mean what realistic systemic changes would you just love to see um, the UK take up or the EU take up Oh, that's easy. I mean, uh, a global protocol on plastic would be would be the first thing. So mm. in the same way that we solved the hole in the ozone layer by, you know, the Montreal protocol and a mm. very laser like focus on CFCs and saying that, you know, that as a, as a gas was clearly damaging mm. um, the hole in the ozone layer, but incentivizing other innovation that moved us away from CFCs, you had the likes of um, DuPont or Dow Chemicals kind of developing that innovation, scaling and growing as a consequence of, of, of technologies that, that weren't harming it mm. and brands benefiting by, by kind of championing that technology to consumers. For plastic pollution, we need, we need a similar response. We know what the issue is. Mm. We've got incredible awareness. We maybe don't have as much science and data around kind of understanding how uh, epidemic this, this problem is. Um, and we need to economically model out a lot of the different um, alternatives and also to look at the life cycle analysis to see what is the best, most efficient mm. use of resources to, to effectively scale and, and solve what is um, basically a 316 million ton problem. So every mm. year we're making 316 million tons of plastic and 32% of that, as I was saying, winds up in nature, 40% mm. in landfill, 14% mm. is incinerated, only 14% is recycled. But in that 14%, 8% is downcycled. So kind of that would be taking you know, polyorphans, a lot of this stuff, mm. and just turning it into, um, um, you know, lumber or, or children's playgrounds or, or some, yeah. just a second life, yeah. but not truly circular. 2% mm. is what we call circular, going back mm. into more food packaging situations again. Yeah. So it's a, very, it's a very, very big issue. Mm. Um, and I think really the only silver bullet is, is kind of collaboration and, and people willing to work together and lean into the problem. Mm. Would you be able to showcase your product, I mean, in terms of the cup? Yeah. Um, what I found really interesting was I saw your cup in um, uh, another office in this lab. Okay. Um, and it had a sell-by date. Now, sell-by dates for me are normally synonymous with food and drink. It's really interesting to see a sell-by date on a cup. Yeah. Um, 
first of all, would you be able to explain that? And secondly, like, has there been uh, like an education problem to the end customer when it comes to this? The issue is if you take all of this incredible science and you communicate that directly to Mrs. Miggins, yeah. um, the risk is that this just goes out the car window. Maybe yeah. not necessarily Mrs. Miggins, but yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah. People will litter because they will think it will behave like an apple or behave like a, a banana. Yeah. And ultimately after this day, it will. It will not persist. It will, it will fully biodegrade. But mm. that's not what we want. We want to trigger the right response with consumers. So that was why we developed on this whole idea of perishability. Okay. So whilst the consumers are incredibly confused mm. by what we call the eco-labeling jungle. So yeah. every time a brand comes up with a new idea, it sticks a green leaf on it. Mm. Um, and the consumer really doesn't know what to do with all of that information. Do mm. I compost it? Can it biodegrade? Do I recycle mm. it? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a real um, um, thing that needs to be cut through. Whereas everybody understands perishability. Everybody yeah. understands use by dates. Mm. So because our technology introduces that concept to packaging itself, mm. there is a very definable date by which this will lose its utility mm. and return to nature. Mm. And because we can program that in, it allows us to use that as the primary message to consumers mm. and brands who are innovative and, and their agencies who are kind of up for that type of disruption will build campaigns around that, incentivize consumers to do that. Mm. The consumer does their bit, the brand does their bit, but maybe because recycling can't cope and it gets shipped off to some island in, in Malaysia, it will return to nature and not create microplastic because our technology is in there, mm. which is what we want. Mm. I mean, in terms of um, the end customer, um, I mean, would you be able to kind of highlight the type of customers you guys have or are looking to acquire over the next couple of years? Yeah, so it's a licensing model. So okay. we are just a deep tech company that yeah. has developed a lot of great science. Yeah. We're selling this technology to food packaging companies. And Interesting, the, okay. And the people who sell additives or performance chemicals into the food packaging space. Ah, so okay. we just announced a big partnership with Clariant to bring okay. the technology into Southeast Asia. Clariant would be similar to BASF, mm. Millican Chemical, like a performance additive business. Mm. So we, we license the technology out to businesses like that. But we also work um, what we kind of call beyond the value chain. So we also work with the brands and we work with the standards agencies and we work with the policy environment to make sure that end to end, the whole system mm. is, is set up for success. So we don't just merely outsource the technology yeah. and not see it through. Yeah. We work with fast food companies, uh, retailers, um, fast moving consumer goods companies to find the right packaging, third party test everything because everything that we do and put on mm. the market will be third party tested in ISO accredited laboratories before it goes out there. And then once you've got that data back, we then commercialize in parts of the portfolio, parts of the world that mm. the brand will ultimately decide. Yeah. So when creating a disruptive technology, how does a company like yours navigate their way around the traditional value chain? <laughs> I mean, that must be really difficult because you're disrupting quite some major big players here. How does a company like yours kind of navigate their way through a traditional value, value chain? So it's a great question. You have to build the internal muscles that allows you to do that. So it's not like running a traditional P&L mm. where you might be the best t-shirt manufacturer in the world or you might be the cheapest or you might be the first. And that's all you need to hammer home is we are the cheapest, we are the first, we are the fastest. Mm. This is very, very different. You need to have technology that has integrity built in. So the mm. first thing is you've got to have integrity in your science, integrity in the culture, and also the partners you're working with. Mm. You also need to have diversity, not just diversity in a HR tick box exercise. You need to be obsessed about where you're weak. What do you not know? If, if everyone looks like me, you've got a problem. If everyone looks like millennials, you, you're missing something. If everyone is like guys in suits, you, you, you're missing something. So you've got to be obsessing about from a capability and a behavior perspective, mm. what are your blind spots and trying to hire in capabilities and mindsets that will cover those, those blind spots. So that's mm. real diversity and real value adding ways. Mm. And, then, and then finally coalition building. So punching above your weight, if you've got all of those things in place, then is something you absolutely have to do. Mm. So we open source parts of our IP and are working with the British Standards Institute to use that to create a new standard for biodegradability to make better goalposts, to improve the credibility of claims in this whole space. Mm. But ultimately in my PL, that has a cost. So that there is a cost to disruption. Yeah. You need to have investors that understand that and are not looking for you to um, ultimately deliver um, you know, um, numbers in the next year and nothing else 
but they're taking a, a, a longer term view over the next kind of two to three and they understand that all of those disruptive interventions will allow you to to create a market where there was no market previously and maybe the the, the final thing in that space is grassroots engagement so we reached out to um, uh, Robin Wright the actress just to test an idea with a cup that looks very like this and the very first time we thought about the whole recycle by initiative because mm. we were just like you struggling with mm. how would you communicate all of this great science mm. when we came up with that idea we went to Cannes where all the marketers yeah. and, and CMOs go yeah. um, and we reached out to Robin and we just explained the idea to her and she immediately shared it with all of her followers and, and has become a great advocate for the technology yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we took that as a signal that there's really something in that and we've mm. started working with um, other uh, I can't say too much, but other yeah. um, celebrities and mm. other advocates in that space to become part of their fan engagement. Mm. But that will ultimately allow us to kind of engage grassroots, put the technology in their hands and disrupt the way people think about the potential for technologies mm. like this. That's really interesting because not only is your technology innovative, but your marketing model has to be somewhat innovative as well. I mean, we've seen Patagonia as well. Like, I think you're kind of leveraging influences as well, right? Yeah, we don't have big above the line budgets. Yeah. We, you know, we're not, you know, we are investing in the science, investing in the R&D and, and commercializing that, that technology and doing that through partnerships. Mm. But ultimately, if we really are bought into changing the system, we have to look at where the biggest points of leverage are in the system. Mm. And, and one of them is creating new standards. And the other is, is, is ultimately tapping into the types of extinction rebellion type movements out there that mm. are, I think, holding the world to account and probably doing that rightly. Mm. But we do know that for those, move, those types of movements to be successful, they need to pivot quite quickly out of what is wrong to what are they going to champion? What are they going to ask for? What are the positive mm. technologies they're going to get behind? Mm. Um, and we want to make sure that we are part of that, that mix of things that they are yeah. demanding from brands and, and from regulators. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of, say, um, in a fairy tale world from now, three years from now, what do you have, what do you hope to have achieved with Polymateria uh, from a commercial standpoint, from a systemic standpoint, and then also from a company standpoint as well? Yeah, so from a commercial standpoint, I would, I would see us having five big visible R&D partnerships with some of the biggest um, players uh, in their discrete swim lanes. So the biggest manufacturer for PET, the biggest manufacturer for polypropylenes, that we are developing the next iteration of our technology in partnership with many of those organizations. A lot of that work has already started, mm. but because we're under NDA, yeah. I can't talk about okay. it. But in three years, we'll be able to reveal that, but we'll also be commercializing those solutions and tapping into those new adjacent markets in things like agriculture, in things like uh, aquaculture, silviculture, mm. um, and, and other adjacent areas that need solutions for biodegradability. Mm. I think we'll also evolve out of being an additive into actually being inside the resin itself. So when you okay. start to think about selling resins to the yeah. food packaging industry, that it just becomes the new normal for mm. our technology to be, to be in there. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, in terms of, that, that's about it, in terms of my questions, I've got a quick fire round. Most valuable purchase under 100 pounds? Most valuable purchase under a hundred pounds. Oh gosh, um, it's a bit of a start turn. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, I mean, it'd have to be one of these cups, <laughs> <laughs> and they're a lot less than a hundred pounds. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> we'll go with that. Um, uh, is there a book that you would give to a fellow start uh, startup founder in your sector? <laughs> or have you received a great book that's kind of inspired you in this sector? Books. Um, there's, there's three you have to read. Super okay. Pumped. Super Pumped. On the failings of, of Uber and uh, Travis Kalanick and how they got <laughs> so much right, but how they got so much wrong. wrong. Okay. Because I think as a startup, you have to obsess about, uh, you know, what's, what's, what, have, what has caused others to wash up on the rocks mm. and what do you need to do to do the exact opposite. Yeah. Um, Tyrannos. Uh, the story of, of um, uh, Cats and Holmes. <laughs> yep. Um, again, another example of what not to do. And I think it's only from really absorbing those, those lessons learned that you, you kind of really appreciate the, the power of creating the right culture and doing things in the right way yeah. and getting the right type of investors on board and integrity and diversity mm. and coalition building 
all come out of reading those books and realizing how to do things the wrong way mm. and how we need to do things the right way. And then finally, there's a book called Inspired Companies, Interesting. which is probably the only Bible that I know of in this space. It's by a lady called Lisa McCallum, mm -hmm. who led a lot of Nike's work to kind of come from a lot of issues and challenges with their supply chain uh, and, and poverty in their supply chain through to Nike being until recently, on the forefront <laughs> of a lot of some of our bigger yeah. uh, global issues like obesity and um, poverty for girls mm. in, in India and Sri Lanka and, yeah. and other places. So mm. um, th they would be my three, my three recommendations. Inspire Companies, Super Pumped, and I think it's called Bad, bad Blood. blood. Yeah. <laughs> Every company in this lab we've interviewed has mentioned Bad Blood. That's because <laughs> I've given it to them. I gave it to Susanna. Oh, oh did you? Did, yeah, she yeah. said, she she said that as well. Copy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, what would you say is the most valuable advice you've received, personally or within business? Wow. It's not about you. Hmm. Interesting. Is that what kind of inspired you to join? Um, as CEO for this company? No, it was ago. a long time ago. It was, um, it was at a time in my career where I was really buying into the rat race. I kind of thought that the upper out model in mm. consultancies and in pretty much every other mm. big business was something that you needed to compete at all costs. And I, I was an athlete before, so that kind of made sense to me mm. was, you know, you, you, you kind of fast track to your career, you get the next promotion, you get the next role, responsibility, and, and, and really, um, that's probably a poster child for the worst way to, to, to kind of look for a career and look for fulfillment and look for something that's lasting and, and, and will have a legacy. I think mm. that the sooner you realize that it's actually about inspiring others and, and finding ways that you can unlock their potential and their, you know, um, uh, hidden synergies in particular going back to that diversity thing mm. you can imagine the different types of mindsets and people that we've got in this organization helping each one of them uh, become greater than the sum of our parts if I just do that and nothing else we'll succeed yeah uh, but it's not about me yeah um, is there a is there a failure that's kind of set you up for success in hindsight <laughs> you want just one <laughs> um, <laughs> I think navigating the politics of, of, of big blue chip organizations, for, for me, uh, that's as close to house of cards as, <laughs> um, as, it, as it gets. Yeah. Um, and the scar tissue that comes with that of uh, having good intentions, doing things in exactly the right way, being strategic, being inspiring, being motivating. But at the end of the day, these environments can cut you apart mm. like nothing else and mm. having seen all the different types of things that can go wrong to me and to people around me you bring a lot of that wisdom with you into how if somebody is I think crazy enough to give you a, um, a greenfield opportunity to put everything into practice that you've, mm. you've seen um, you, you, can, you can make sure you don't repeat any of, this, any of those mistakes mm. so I think big corporates are good places to learn but maybe they're not the best platforms for real meaningful change. Mm. Uh, final question, uh, what gives you the most joy in what you do? What gives me the most joy in what I do? Um, I think it's contagion. It's, it's that word that we kind of started off mm. on, which is the ripple effect, where you start off with something that's, that's like a, a small epicenter, and then you see people starting to claim credit and that's okay, people starting to amplify it, people becoming advocates that you never expected them to become advocates. Um, a, a Jamaican friend of mine, a guy called Mikey Williams, who used to be my training partner when I was, a, was an athlete, he used to say to me, Neil, victory has many fathers, <laughs> but when you lose, you're an orphan. <laughs> and I think that's what this is about. Yeah. It's, it's about achieving that advocacy mm. uh, within all the right circles that will ultimately reframe the whole narrative around plastic pollution and, and, and innovations like this. Mm. Amazing. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here. Thank you so much. <laughs> pleasure. Take care.